body and I'm a mountaineer, climber, speaker and author. So planning to go to Mount McKinley started a bit unusually really. One of the guys I knew very well, one I didn't know so well, and we'd only had a couple of weekends to climb together and suddenly we're thrust onto North America's highest and tallest mountain but also one of the toughest peaks in the world and one of the most renowned for bad weather, avalanches, frostbite, horror stories, helicopter rescues and within a few months there we were and actually taking this, this huge undertaking on board. When we got down to Anchorage we couldn't see anything of McKinley. The weather was particularly bad and actually flying into the range we thought saw very little of the mountain because again the cloud was down. I found later McKinley towers over the range and yet I have to say it goes through your mind of what have I undertaken because this thing really is super big, super daunting and it does take your breath away, really, besides the fact that the air is at minus 25 and it's cold anyway, you know, and that takes your breath away. I think seeing this this huge wall of ice and snow, and it is a wall, monstrous south face of McKinley. And when I first looked at McKinley from the south side, I actually got a, a, a real eye-to-eye -eye look at this peak. I thought, that is monstrous, that is huge. And particularly Steve uh, and, and also Anthony were sort of, you know, let's get there, let's do this. And, and I did doubt myself quite a few times. And particularly when we actually got on the first few days climbing, there was some pretty exposed, pretty hard stuff, actually. But every move, every block of ice that falls off some days, you do think, why am I doing this? What am I doing? What's going to happen? Why is it going right? Where is it going wrong? And, and it's very forwards and backwards in your mind. So on the mountain, it's summit day, and the effects of the cold are starting to bite into myself and Steve and Anthony who are climbing with me. And... Steve's feeling cold, my face is getting cold, we're stuck on this mountain, it's difficult to see a lot, we can't go anywhere, we've got to stay alive, we're shouting at each other and we're only four and five feet apart. It's just this constant barrage of trying to work out the next minute or two. And the cold crept up. The point I realised something was wrong was the morning after the summit attempt. The left hand side of my face had been cold the night before and to get out of this bitterly cold wind which the rangers suggested got a wind chill of minus 60 centigrade we'd spent a night in a crevasse so just a hole in the ice getting some protection from the wind really not so much from the cold we got out of the crevasse and I was struggling to hold things so I thought OK, not a problem, put the radio on the top of the edge of the crevasse, let's all get out, sort our lives out. And as I was going up, I touched the radio with my left elbow and I knocked it and it slid about 300 feet down the ice. And as I started to walk down, I kept falling over and I couldn't work out why. And I slid on my backside down to the side of the radio and it looked unhurt, undamaged. So I picked it up and tried to walk back and I was struggling to walk and I didn't know why. And I was struggling to hold things as well. And again, I didn't know why. And it was the classic old thing of Nigel it's staring you in the face, but you still can't see it. I had one moment sat on the top of the mountain later where Steve at this point had gone for help because he was very worried about myself. He was the strongest climber and he took a choice to go and try and find some other climbers on the mountain that we knew people were up there. And I sat with Anthony for a number of hours and we hoped rescue would come and we just tried to position ourselves the best possible within some rocks to keep the wind out, but also to be visible. And I can remember taking the glove off my left hand and my hand was, I can only describe it as contorted slightly claw-like and ivory, like a yellowy ivory colour. It was the most bizarre thing to see. And it wasn't until later, of course, we were thankfully rescued by helicopter, taken off to hospital and defrosted, frankly. And I didn't realise until then that all of my fingers had been frozen solid to the knuckles. My feet had been completely frozen solid, probably to the ankles. 
and the left-hand side of my face had got ice crystals right down through the skin and frozen solid again. And I don't think it dawned on me till I started to thaw and people said to me, you know, you've had very severe frostbite. Well, my actual injuries were severe frostbite to the feet, particularly the toes, both heels, every finger and thumb, left-hand side of the face and nose. Initially, my toes and fingertips started to die. My nose and left cheek went black within days, but my fingers and toes did not. They took a little longer. There's a lot goes through your mind when you start to see your fingers and toes turning, firstly, deep purple, and then black. It's not an instant thing. It can take anything from five to 10 days to get to that stage. And I very quickly understood that they were badly, you know, I was badly injured. There were things going very badly wrong with me. They don't bandage them, they don't hide them. You will sit and watch them. And I think at the time, initially anyway, the first couple of weeks, I just don't think the shock had hit me of what had happened. And particularly when I was back in the UK and the wounds had stabilised, I was actually typing, writing, getting around, using things with frostbitten hands, just like granite fingers and I was typing away with granite fingers basically uh, and shaving myself and sort of amazing people you just got to the fact of well they're still me they're dead but they're still me I've always been very thankful for Anthony for staying with me and trying to, you know, keep me going as much as himself because if I'd been left there on my own then it would be a completely different issue. Physically I could have been the same but it's the mental thing. You need the support of other people and this is something I've talked about quite a lot with people afterwards. You need the support of whether it be friends, family, whoever to get you through very difficult times in your life and just being sat there you'd have probably just frozen to death. The media coverage of the entire experience was quite surprising. I never expected this, I never expected to get frostbite, and it did launch us into the media. And 13, 14 years later, I'm still using some of the same contacts now. Everything I do, those contacts are still interested because of what I've been through. Yes, we went through 24 hours of near-death, epic. There's no two ways about it. Having frostbite has taught me more about me and about people, and about how we work as human beings, then I think any education, any sitting with people for hours or going on expeditions could ever do. And it's a very drastic lesson, frankly, having all your toes amputated, having all your fingertips cut off, nose falling away. But it makes you an incredibly strong person. People say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, I can absolutely agree with that with my experiences. It's made me understand that there is more to life than getting up, going to work, coming home, going to bed. It's made me understand that certain things are obviously more important than others. And the fact of people seem to talk about death, which bothers me because people say 100 things to do before you die. And I'd rather change that to 100 things you want to do while you live. And it's made me do that, it's made me live. It's made me get up every morning with a smile on my face and open eyes going, let's see the day, let's go and do things, let's meet people, let's experience new things. Don't put it off till tomorrow. There is the strangest thing as we speak, I have been invited to return. Will I do it? That I can't tell you. But I'd be very tempted to go and have a look. I really would. Quite how I do it, I don't know, but then again, the mountain's not going to go away and it would be really interesting to look at it again.